I hope so. This is what it says concerning the Antichrist in that last seven year period. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week or for seven years. The Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel for seven years. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation or the worship to cease. And this is what Daniel also said concerning this man. In the latter times of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. This is the Antichrist. This is that dark king. This is that wicked king that's going to come, and he's going to make a covenant with Israel. Israel's been restored. They're expecting their Messiah to come. They're expecting that their prophecy is going to be fulfilled, that they're going to get their temple. And this guy is going to give them their temple. He's going to give them what they're looking for. And through his policy, he will cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So this one that is coming in the last seven year period of this amazing prophecy is going to be very successful. He's going to make a covenant with Israel, but he will be destroyed. And Daniel says this at the end. The vision of the e evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut it up, the vision, for it shall be for many days. And so God, the angel, I should say, the angel spoke to Daniel and said, what you've seen is true, but it's not going to happen for a long, long time. And we're living in that long time right now, brothers and sisters. And Daniel said, I fainted. I was sick certain days afterwards. I rose up. I did the king's business. I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Well, now that we go into the New Testament, we do understand it. And this is what Paul says concerning what Daniel was given by the angel. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets or holds back will hold back or let until he be taken out of the way and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness of them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And it says, for this cause God will send them strong delusion, that they would believe a lie. So there's coming a time in this world where people who have rejected God for so long, God says, let them try this, let them have this. And it will be a delusion that will be so powerful that people will not be able to withstand it. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him, that you be not so soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. I want to get rid of a false teaching right here. The apostles did not believe Jesus was returning eminently. They didn't. And here it says it. He says, I don't want you to get too shaken up as if it's coming. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come except there come a falling away first. They understood that there was something that had to happen before Jesus returned. That false doctrine had to come into the church. False teaching had to come into the church. Well, that's happened. That's already happened. And he says, then that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. He will oppose, he'll exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing that he is God. So this Antichrist during the last seven years is going to make a covenant with Israel. He's going to build a temple. And they're going to sacrifice animals in Jerusalem once again. 
But halfway through, he's going to cause the sacrifice to stop. Because he's going to go into the temple and he's going to say, I'd like to tell you who I really am. I am your God. And this will be Satan. So let's look back one more time. Babylonian captivity, Daniel 70 weeks. These two prophecies run in parallel. This one could have ended if the Jewish people had repented, but it was extended. 1948, Israel will be invaded by Gog at some point, and there will be a seven-year tribulation period divided into two sections of 42 months. Daniel 70 weeks is extended also because they did not receive, they did not accept, they did not repent. And so there's a gap between the 69th and the 70th week that takes us right up to the tribulation period. Two amazing prophecies running in parallel, each of them with very, very accurate dates, predicting things all along the way that were fulfilled, all point to a seven-year tribulation period that's going to come upon this world when... Israel is invaded by Russia. The temple was destroyed by Rome, but the temple will be rebuilt. Something is going to trigger where the temple once again is going to be offered to Israel as a peace token. What could that possibly be? Currently, this is just from a website of the Temple Institute. Currently, there are many groups that are working with Israel to rebuild their temple. And it says, I've got it underlined here, the Temple Institute's ultimate goal is to see Israel rebuild the Holy Temple on the Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. They have the furniture. They have all the stuff necessary. The building supplies are there. They're just waiting for the building permit. And very soon, you're going to see in Jerusalem, this location is going to be a construction site where the temple will be built in Jerusalem. That's going to cause a problem in the Middle East. That's going to cause a serious problem in the Middle East because that is the site of a very important Muslim mosque. Now, when we studied Daniel's prophecy of the statue... We understood that this concerned Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But Rome ultimately became divided. Just like on the statue, the two legs became divided. And half of it became what is today the Middle East. The other half became what is Europe. And each of these has become two major religious centers involved in the conflict today. Rome on one side with Europe, and on the other side, we have the rise of the desire for the Islamic Caliphate coming out of Mecca. We know the people of the prince that shall come is coming from Rome. But let's take a look at the Middle East and what's going on in Mecca. And I've taught a little bit of this in the past, but this is, again, a refresher so that we understand. Abraham was given promises of children. He had Isaac, he had Ishmael. Jacob, which became Israel, Esau. And ultimately, Jesus Christ came through the seed of Abraham, and out of Ishmael and Esau came the Arabs. So we have two bloodlines, two groups of people coming out of Abraham. God promised Abraham that he was going to give him children. And the Lord brought Abraham forth and said, now look toward heaven and tell the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, so shall thy seed be. You will have seed as the stars. And then on another time, and it said the angel of the Lord said unto Abraham, out of heaven, the second time, and said, I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this, thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, 
thy seed shall forget, possess the gates of his enemies. And so God says, I'm going to give you seed like the stars of heaven. But then at another point, he says, I'm going to give you seed like the sand of the seashore. And yet a third time God spoke. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot separated from him, lift up thine eyes, look unto the place northward, southward, east, west, for the land that thou seest, and I will give it to thee in thy seed, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Notice these three different types of seed, like the stars of heaven, which I believe very much is the Christians through Jesus Christ. We are the seed of Abraham. We are the spiritual heavenly seed of Abraham by faith. But the children of the sand of the sea is the Jews. These are the people of the earth. But then there are those that are as the dust, which are the Arab nations today, which came through Ishmael, which came through Esau. Each of these three groups of descendants are involved in end time prophecy. Israel has returned to their land. The church will be raptured, taken out of this earth when we get our job done. And we'll talk about that later. And the Arab nations seek world power in a prophesied struggle that will ultimately lead the world into Armageddon. So each of these three seeds of Abraham, the seeds as the stars of heaven, we've got a job to do as the sand of the sea, God's fulfilling his prophecy to the Jews, and as the dust of the earth, they're rising up all of this, really, since 1948. Psalms 83, an amazing prophecy concerning the Arabs in the end time. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. And they're speaking of, let's get rid of Israel. That the name of Israel may no more be in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederated against Israel or against thee. And who is this that's going against Israel? The tabernacle of Edom, the Ishmaelites, of Moab, of the Hagarenes, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher is joined unto them. They have hope in the children of Lot. These are the Arab nations that are gathered together at a certain time against a nation of Israel to get rid of them, who say, let us take for ourselves the house of God in possession. Notice that. We want that location. Those are ours. They can't have it for their temple. That they may know, God says, I'm going to let them be confounded and troubled forever. I'm going to put them to shame. They're going to perish that they may know whose name alone is Jehovah, that thou art most high over all the earth. There is coming a conflict in the end days that is going to put two people against each other concerning the location of the house of God and the name of God. And that battle is raging right now in our generation concerning Jerusalem, concerning Mecca, concerning Jehovah, and concerning Allah. I want you to look at this amazing event in 1 Kings the prophets prayed to Baal until noon, and they shouted, answer us, Baal, and kept dancing around the altar that they had built. But no one came, and at noon, Elijah started making fun of them. So the prophets prayed louder, and they cut themselves with knives and daggers according to their ritual until the blood flowed. And we read this in the Old Testament, and we think, what a strange event that people would cut themselves until blood flows to get their God's attention. This is what happens in our world today among the Muslims. This is a very, very common ritual that they go through every year. About 600 years after Christ, there was a man from the Arabian desert who claimed to have been in contact of an angel and given a call to restore the lost religion of Allah, Islam. This religion also has a scenario for end time events with a great leader called the Mahdi who they expect to appear very soon. This is what Islam teaches about their great leader that they expect is coming very, very soon. He will rule Islam from Jerusalem for seven years. 
He will have close companions, including Elijah and Elisha. His coming will be announced by earthquakes, seas, storms, and fire over the sky. He will be a fanatical Muslim. He will find the Ark of the Covenant and will produce a, co produce a copy of the Bible from the Ark that proves Islam is true. Those who refuse to convert will be beheaded. A mountain of gold will be discovered under the Euphrates River. He will receive aid from the east. The people of Iraq will help him. He will be charismatic, young, very handsome, and all the world will love him. He will be joined by Jesus. He will fill the world with peace and justice. But this is what Jesus says concerning a man like this. For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets that will show you great signs and wonders insomuch it were possible they would deceive the very elect. Behold, we have told you, we've told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, behold, he is in the desert. Do you know where they say the Mahdi is today? In hiding in the desert. He said, they're going to say unto you, he's in the desert. Don't go forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Because this is what the Bible teaches about the Antichrist. This is the stuff about the Mahdi. He will rule Islam from Jerusalem. Well, the Antichrist is going to rule Jerusalem for seven years. The companions, he will have com close companions, including the false prophet. His coming will be announced by earthquakes, seas, storms, fire in the sky. There's going to be a horrible catastrophe. We already studied that. Gog and Magog and the Antichrist will rise to power. He will be fanatical. He will enter the holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is to dwell, and he will demand all that worship him and receive his mark or be beheaded. The Euphrates River will be dried up. The kings of the east will march toward Jerusalem in an army of 200 million. The people of Iraq will fight against Israel. He will be charismatic, young, very handsome, and all the world will love him. He will be destroyed by Jesus. And he will fill the world with false peace and safety. Our world is being set up so much that when this false leader comes after a major, major catastrophe, when everyone is desperate, they're going to fall for this because of their lack of understanding of the word of God. The Antichrist will change time. Daniel 7 says, and he will speak great words against the Most High. He will wear out the saints of the Most High. He will think to change times and laws. These are some of the tallest buildings in the world. The tall one there is in Dubai. The other one is the one we just built where the Twin Towers used to be, and then finally that used to be the Sears Tower in Chicago. Just for scale, this is the building that the Muslims have built in Mecca. It's huge. It's larger than thing, anything we have in America. And size-wise, it's massive. And it has a giant clock tower on this skyscraper, and it sits in the holy city of Mecca, and the Muslims want to make this the official timekeeper of the world. Right now, we all follow what's called Greenwich time from England. Saudi Arabia says, no, 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 no. This clock is what we should use for time. This clock sits 1,200 feet up, and it is now the world's second largest skyscraper, and it overlooks the Grand Mosque. The clock tower is the landmark feature of the Seven Tower Kingdom Complex, and this is the part that bothers me. This was built by the Bin Laden group. They destroy us, and they build this. And from now on, the Islamic world would like us to refer to Mecca time instead of Greenwich time. The Antichrist will have a mark, which is 666. So we talked a little bit about this last week. Muslims believe the number 666 is a holy number that rep represents the Quran and Muhammad. They claim the book of Revelation was inspired by Satan to teach that 666 is a bad number to prevent Christians from accepting the Quran. But the book of Revelation was written in Greek. And so we have to go to the Greek to take a look at what 666 looks like. It's the gamma, it's she, 
and it's chi. And this is 666. It looks like this. It looks like an X for 600. It looks like an E for 60. And it looks like an arrow with the bottom part missing for six. And if you look at this Arabic script right here, the X, the E, and the arrow is all there. These are the elements that go into what is written on the top of this clock tower. The X is there, the E is there, the arrow is there, but for a Muslim, that doesn't just say 666. It says Allah. That's amazing. And just so that you can get some scale on the size of this tower, that's about a dozen men inside of the moon when they were building it. And above this tower and above these markings is the moon which is the symbol, the ancient symbol of Baal. And they cut themselves. And the battle is over the name of God and the sanctuary of God in our generation. The Antichrist will change laws. It says that he will think to change times and laws. The law of Moses has been the foundation of the legal system since the time of Christ. Muslims seek to change that by bringing in their Sharia law. We hear about it all the time. Sharia law for France, Sharia law for England, Sharia law. And nations are caving into this. For 2,000 years, we have based our legal system upon the law of Moses. That's all going to change if he has his way, and he will think to change time and laws. And the Antichrist will defile the temple. It says, Jesus said, when you see the abomination in the temple spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and even to this day, if you were to go to Jerusalem, when the Muslims pray, they pray with their backside facing the temple in Jerusalem. The Bible says that there is coming a major judgment upon these nations. The Bible says, tells us that the Arab nations will come against Israel in the end times to try to take its land, and God will respond by rendering their lands desolate. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, Edom, and prophesy against it, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, Mount Seir. I will stretch out my hand against thee. I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste. Thou shalt be desolate. Thou shalt know that I am the Lord, because thou hast a hatred of old, and hast hurled the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of the iniquity of the end. And so God says, In the end time, there is coming a conflict, and these nations that are known as Mount Seir and Edom are going to be judged by God because of their turning against Israel at this time. Looking at a map of the Middle East, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Mount Seir, Edom, that's Saudi Arabia. That's Saudi Arabia. Now this brings us to the nations of China, the nations of the East. In Revelation 16, 12, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water there was dried up that the way of the kings of the East might be prepared. 200 million is the size of the army that's coming from the nations of the East, the kings of the East. And Turkey has built a dam across the river Euphrates so that as this prophecy says, the river will be dried and these nations will march and move into the Middle East. And if you follow current events at all on what's happening with China and the Middle East, you would realize that China is not the China of old. When we think of China, we think of cherry blossoms, we think of beautiful old buildings, we think of wonderful scenes. That is not the China of today. The China of today is an incredibly powerful economic engine, if I can put it that way. And it has one of the most powerful, largest militaries in the world. And they're building this for something. They're building this for something. 
And the Bible says in the end days that these nations are going to move into the Middle East and quite possibly the purpose will be oil. And so as we look at this map of these different international things that happened during the end times, all of them seem to be pointing in one direction, and that is to Israel. All of it is going in this direction that the Bible said that it would. And so we've looked at Israel, we've looked at the Gentile empires, the church and the rapture really becomes what's in the minds of a lot of Christians. Where does this fit in to all of these events? And I, I wanna say this, if, if you've been following me for the last two sessions, everything that's happening doesn't concern the church. It doesn't. All of these things happen without the church. The church isn't even mentioned because these are things pertinent or that pertain to Israel and Israel's acceptance of the Messiah and their rejection of the Messiah and their being returned back to the land. And the purpose of the church, the reason the church is here, Paul says that you were grafted in because Israel was blinded. We were brought to salvation outside of the covenant of Israel because Israel fell. But when Israel's restored and these things start to happen, what's the purpose for the church on the earth? None. And so God is going to take us out of here. He's going to rapture his church. He's going to remove us because we are a part of, if I can put it this way, the parentheses of God. Because Israel rejected, because Israel didn't repent, because the Messiah was not accepted by, by the, the Jews, we were brought in. But he's going to take us out when our job is done. And at this point, John said, I had another vision. And I saw an open door in heaven. And the voice that sounded like a trumpet, which I heard speaking to me, before I said, come up hither and I will show you what must happen after this. Paul says it like this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die. But when the last trumpet sounds, we shall be changed in an instant and as quick as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead shall be raised, never to die again, and we shall all be changed. He says in Thessalonians, there will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet. The Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus was outside the city of Jerusalem talking to his disciples one day and they were looking at the temple and saying how beautiful the temple is. And Jesus said, that temple is going to be destroyed. And we've talked about that today. And the disciples were just shocked. They were amazed. But Jesus understood these prophecies. He said, no, not one stone is gonna stand upon another. It's all gonna be cast down. But then he gave them the parable of a fig tree and he said, that there will come a time, though, when it's brought back again. And when it's brought back again, and all things, these things start to be fulfilled, I want you to know that that generation will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And so where are we, brothers and sisters, in all of this? We are at the point where the clock of God, the calendar of God, the plan of God is moving full speed ahead, and we are in the last generation. I don't know how long a generation is. I was born in 1953. Israel was restored as a nation in 1948. So I'm gonna say it, it's my generation. And I'm old enough to park out front. <laughs> Jesus is coming when you see me parking in the front. <laughs> when will the temple be destroyed? When is this going to happen? They asked Jesus three questions. When will the temple be destroyed? 
And he gave a clear answer to them. He said, the temple will be destroyed and it will remain so until the Antichrist. But he says, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, then you know. They asked another question. What is the sign of your return? And he gave a clear answer to them. He said, Israel will be scattered throughout all the world, but they will be brought back again. And the time of the Gentiles will be over. And the last question they asked, what is the sign of the end of the age? And the answer he gave them is very important for us today. He said, the church will preach the gospel until they're taken out, and then shall the end come. And so, really, the message for us right now is preach the gospel until. This Bible prophecy is wonderful stuff, and we have to get it right, and Lord willing, next week, I, I want to try to put it all together. But our message is the gospel. We have to preach the gospel Paul said it like this. Now, I want to remind you, my friends, of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received. And you are saved by the gospel if you hold firmly to it until, unless it was for nothing that you believed. Of greatest importance that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and then he was raised to life three days later as written in the scriptures. Of greatest importance in the gospel, Christ died for our sins. He was buried and that he raised three days later according to the scriptures. That's the message that we have to preach. When a person comes to Christ and they realize that he died for their sins, it brings them to a place of repentance. We have to fall at our knees at the cross. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Because if we don't come to a place of repentance and acknowledgement of our sin, all of what I'm talking about concerning prophecy is really important for you because you're going through it. But if you can bring yourself to a place of repentance, God, forgive me. And if you're new, then you need to be buried with Christ. The gospel is that he died and was buried and it says that we are buried with Christ in baptism. And when a person repents, they enter into a covenant relationship with God. In the Old Testament, there was a way for a person to enter into a covenant relationship, and it was through circumcision. In the New Testament, in the church age, we enter a covenant relationship by being buried with Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ when we're baptized. And then God fills us with the Holy Ghost, we resurrect in our spirit to newness of life. This is the gospel that we preached, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world as a witness. And I am so thrilled that as we look at all the end time events, and we see Israel, and we see Gog, and we see the Muslim nations, and we see China, is the church preaching the gospel around the world today? And my answer is yes, we are. We are in revival. We are seeing revival around the world like we never thought possible. And all of this has happened since the 1940s. Is it a coincidence? I don't believe it is. Pastor, Bishop. <laughs>